he said he wanted me to speak about the origin of races and nations, but uh, the more I researched the theme, the more I really began to realize the, the real power of it and the real interest that is connected with it. One of our fondest memories as we grew up in our Bible classes or in vacation Bible school uh, was the singing of little children's songs. And one of them in particular that we all remember were the words, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Well, that song actually begs a question. Now, maybe not to us when we were children, but as you grow older, it does raise the question, how did the red folks and the yellow folks and the brown folks and the black folks and the white folks come into existence? How did all that take place? And the answer to that question is the assignment that has been given to me today. And so I am going, not going to be delivering all the material that I have in the uh, manuscript today. If you want to have all that material, I would encourage you to buy the book because I have some other material in it and some sources that I think will be helpful to you in uh, studying out the theme. But I am going to be trying to preach as opposed to try to give a lecture. I firmly believe that it's far better to try to preach a lesson in a situation like this than to try to give a cold text to an audience of people. The process of the beginning of races and nations actually, of course, begins with God, as everything else does. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through verse 28, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. And God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and upon every living thing that moveth upon the face of the earth. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says, And God formed man of the dust of the earth, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so we very definitely can say the beginning of the process of men and nations and races began with God. But we also can say that Adam is the progenitor of the human race as well, and Eve, of course, the mother of all living. The word Adam is both a formal name as well as a descriptive statement, as many names are descriptive. We generally say that Adam, in a general sense, means mankind. Whereas the word literally in the Hebrew language indicates ruddy and thus might be indicative of the color of the skin of Adam and Eve. You know, I get rather amused at uh, a lot of white folks that feel like that uh, God may, apparently sometimes to them might be a white God, but he's not. And the first man, the first woman he created was a ruddy brown color. And so we need to recognize the fact that God created Adam and Eve from the dust of the ground, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. In Genesis 3 and verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Hebrew word for Eve literally means life or life spring or the giver of life. And so God then is the ultimate source of all mankind and he brought them about through Adam and through Eve. Well, the history of men and nations and, and races and nations goes down through Noah and his three sons. Of course, all flesh were destroyed on the earth by the great flood except for Noah and his three sons and their wives. The cause of the total corruption of mankind and the sinfulness of his heart, it repented God that he made man and so he determined that he would destroy all men and all animals from the face of the earth. But there was one exception. And that was Noah and his three sons and their wives. Genesis 6 and verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the reason why Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord is found in verse 9 where it says, Noah was a just man and perfect or blameless in his generation. And Noah walked with God. We're reminded of the statement that is made about Enoch, that Enoch 
was a man that walked with God and he was not. In other words, he didn't die because God took him. And so we have here a man that walked his life in accordance with the will of the Heavenly Father. It's very interesting that John says that if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so we have the charge from God that we also are to be men that walk with God. Well, his family tree actually sprang out of the son of Adam and Eve, Seth. You remember that Cain had taken the life of his brother Abel, and then later the Bible says that Seth was born. Interesting statement is made about Seth in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. I don't know for sure. I don't think that probably he has in mind necessarily only that Seth looked like his father, Adam. But we may have here a statement very much like the statement made about man's creation and the, and the statement of God that let us make man in our own image, indicating that Seth was a man who also desired to fulfill the will of the Lord and to do what God wanted. But anyway, Noah, coming from the lineage of Seth, had three sons. They were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And after the flood, the charge was given by God to Noah and to his sons. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and replenish the earth. Now the descendants of Shem and Ham and Japheth are listed in what is called the table of nations or the history of their three families in Genesis chapter 10. And after the genealogies are given, there is a summary statement that is made about Noah and about Shem, Ham, and Japheth. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Genesis 10, verse 5. And one chapter earlier in Genesis chapter 9, verse 29, these are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole world overspread. And so they are the source of all races and of all nations. Now, the nations were divided according to the divine will of God, not just according to the will of man, but according to the divine will of God. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8 says, The Lord God divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam. And apparently he has reference here to Genesis chapter 10, verses 31 and 32, which says, These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues and their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the son of Noah, sons of Noah, after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. I think it's imperative that we realize, however, that even though God separated men into nations and languages, the same blood flows through the veins of all of us. In Acts 17, chapter, verses 24 through verse 28, you remember the statement made by the Apostle Paul as he preached to those, those intellectual Greeks in Mar on Mars Hill. He said, God that made the world and all things therein hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. For in him we live and move and have our being. Well, a question that comes to mind and a very logical question is, what about the specific groups of individuals and nations that sprang from Shem and Ham and Japheth? Well, there's been a lot of research done. In fact, all you've got to do is get on the Internet if you want to find out about it and just type in origin of races and nations and you'll get tons of material. Some of it good and not, some of it not so good. Some of it is a lot of speculation. In fact, uh, just before we came up here, in fact, last night my wife was looking on the Internet and she looked up a site with a local Baptist church here in town and the fellow had all kinds of uh, divisions of things created by the descendants of the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But there was only one problem. He gave absolutely no proof for anything that he wrote. He just stated it. And so uh, I'm afraid that a lot that is written about the origin of races and nations, when it gets down to specifics, is really a matter of speculation. It is not a matter 
uh, biblical revelation. But we do know certain things from the descendants that are listed in the book of Genesis chapter 10 about the various races and nations that sprang from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. For example, we talk about Japheth, we know that he was the father of the Indo-European nations and peoples. Uh, he was the father of the Ukrainians. He was the father of those that lived around the Black Sea and around the nation of Turkey. He was the father of the Greeks and of the Germanic people and of the Armenians and of the Cypriots and of the Spanish. Brother Clyde M. Woods, a professor of Old Testament at Fried Hardeman University, makes this statement about the nations. He says, the nations and the people listed are descendants of Japheth inhabited, generally speaking, the areas bordering the Mediterranean north and west of Palestine. Well, the descendants of Ham were the Ethiopians and the Egyptians and the Canaanites and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and some Arabs and possibly the Cretans. And the descendants of Shem were the Semite people and the Jews and some of the Arabs. And the listing of Shem's descendants, of course, are found in Genesis chapter 10, his sons and their families. But it's interesting over in Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through verse 32, he talks about one particular special aspect of the descendants, descendants rather, of Shem. He talks about one son, Arphaxed, and he talks about one of his children, Selah. And Selah was the one through whom Abraham was to come on the scene. And so Abraham then was a descendant of Shem. And in particular, the son of Shem, Arphaxed, and one of his sons, Selah. Now, the list is given not so much in Genesis chapter 11 for us to understand the general national backgrounds of this particular family of, of Shem, but rather to reveal for us the story of Abram and the story of Abraham. Because in Genesis chapter 12, on the scene pops this man Abram, this descendant of Shem. And the entire rest of the Bible will be centered around three promises that were made by God in covenant to Abraham. That he would make him a great nation, that he would give him the land of Canaan, and that through one of his descendants all the nations of the earth would be blessed. I think it's no accident that the seed land story of Abraham begins directly after then the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10 and in Genesis chapter 11. And of course, this is all a part of God's unfolding, redemptive plan for mankind to be brought about through Jesus Christ, who ultimately would be that seed of Abraham that would bless all nations. And we get back to that song we sang, we were small, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. And God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And you cannot help but read when in Ephesians chapter 2 and see God's intent and purpose that all men, both Jew and Gentile, are to be reconciled in one body by the cross of Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through verse 29, the apostle Paul says that in Christ we're all the sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized, have put on Christ. And so no matter who we are, Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. No matter what the color of our skin might be, no matter what our nationality might be, we are all one if we are in Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, there are a lot of misconceptions about the origin of racial distinctions, the things that make us different. Well, a lot of speculation, very sadly, and I say this without question because I know that it's true from the research I've done, I know it's true, that a lot of speculations are rooted in one thing. It is rooted in racial prejudice. It is rooted in racial prejudice. And a prime illustration of that is what is called the curse of Ham, found in the book of Genesis. Ham, of course, being the son of Noah. You remember that Noah, and when he and Noah and his family, when they came out of the ark, that they made wine and Noah got drunk and one of his sons went in and beheld his nakedness. We don't know what Ham saw or what Ham's attitude was. We don't know whether it was a sin of some homosexual intent or whether it was a matter of just disgracing his father and making light of the nakedness of his father. But whatever it was, there was a curse that was pronounced upon Ham. Now, the reason why a lot of people try to equate the curse of Ham with a slavery of black people 
is strictly one thing, as I mentioned a moment ago, and that's racial prejudice. That and that alone. I appreciate Brother Jack Evans having a debate with a gentleman over this question and referred to it, and I think in his book, The Curing of the Ham, and he cured the ham on that particular account in that debate because he pointed out very clearly that the curse of ham had absolutely nothing to do with the slavery of the black race, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, the reason why a lot of folks that are racially prejudiced use this as a justification for black slavery, and as they would say, superiority of those that are of lighter pigment in skin, is because the, uh, Ham was the father of Cush, who was the descendant who became the nation of Ethiopia. But the truth of the matter is that the curse of Ham was placed upon one descendant of uh, Ham. And that curse was placed on Canaan. Genesis chapter 9, verse 25. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And it's interesting, this statement uh, was made when Noah and his family came out of the ark in Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth from the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And he gives this addendum, and Ham is the father of Canaan. And then later he gives the curse pronounced on, Can on Canaan because of the sin of Ham. Well, now why this insertion? Because the Canaanites would be conquered and become the servants of the Israelites, the descendants of Shem, when they conquered the promised land. The Semite people, the descendants of, of Shem, Abraham and his descendants would conquer the land and they would become, the, read the Hamites, the Canaanites would become the servants of the descendants of Shem. The curse had absolutely nothing to do with a curse on slavery on people of black skin because the Canaanites, folks, were not black. Now, did you hear me? The Canaanites were not black. And such a theory is a misuse of Scripture in order to justify an ungodly attitude of racial prejudice. It's nothing more than that. Now, what does the Bible say about different races of people? Well, to be honest with you, very little. Now, you can study the Bible from one end to the other, and you will find very little about the idea of race. If any, it is more a matter of biological differences at some times that we ascribe to race, but the idea of race is not even brought up in the pages of the Bible. In Romans chapter 9, verse 3, in the New International Version, unfortunately, they mistranslate a word, uh, where Paul is talking about his fellow Jews, those of my own race. But that doesn't mean race in that passage, the Greek language. In fact, in the King James Version and the American Standard Version and the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Version is translated kinsmen according to the flesh, family members, those that are members of the same family. And the same is true in Ezra chapter 9 and verse 2 where some mistakenly translate the word seed that is used there with the word race. The concept of the black and white and yellow and red and brown race is a distinction made by men and not by God in the Bible. And the Bible says that we are all related since we all descended from the same source. Folks, we all got the same daddy. It all goes back to Adam and it all goes back to Noah and his three sons. God is creator of one race, and that race is the human race. And Adam is the father of all people through the descendants of Noah. And nothing is said whatsoever in the scriptures of one color or race of people being superior to other races. Absolutely nothing. Dr. Henry Morris, the author of the book, The Bible Has the Answer, made this statement. He said, racism in the sense of a struggle between races and the conviction that one race is superior to others must be based on evolution, not on theism. Evolutionary scientists may not at all be racist in their personality, or philosophies rather. Nevertheless, the various philosophies that have promoted racism quite unquestionably uh, use the support, uh, used the supposed universal evolutionary process as their intellectual framework for such, for such a position. And he says Nazism and Marxism 
are two notable examples. Now you think about what the evolutionary idea that some races are superior to other races did to the world during World War II. And think about the multiplied millions of people that died under the Soviet system because they felt like certain races were inferior biologically to them. And it goes on to say, genetically speaking, the difference between the various races are extremely small. All are the same species. All are interfertile. If there is a marriage between the races, those offspring that are born are fertile. They can have children. And he says, and produce fertile offspring. The most noticeable difference is skin color. But the fact is that we're all of the same color. We're all of the same color. Some people just have a little more color than others. Skin shade is due to the amount of a substance called melanin in the skin. And, ra- and the more melanin, the darker the skin. Racially mixed individuals can, have parent, can parent children who are all the way from quite dark to quite light or anywhere in between. The predominant shade for freely interbreeding individuals would be brown. I've got two friends. Many of you know Idis England and Haskell England. How many of you know Idis and Haskell? Can you believe those guys are brothers? Now, Idis is... And, and Haskell's daddy was half Cherokee Indian. Well, when old Idis came in the world, he was reddish complected, light complected, blondish red haired, had freckles, sunburned easily. Haskell came in the world, he looked like he was full blood Cherokee. In fact, I worked in youth camp with him for a long time, and he didn't even have to shave very often. Now, they're, they're actual brothers in the flesh. And both their parents are lighter in skin, but the two boys came in the world and they look altogether different from each other. Now, does that mean that there's something wrong? Absolutely not. It just bears out this idea that when there are two people that inter- intermarry and interbreed, that you're going to have different colors. Brother Bert Thompson has a great deal to say about uh, the origin of races and nations. And I love what Brother Thompson said. He said, humans come in a rainbow of colors. Sandy yellows, reddish tans, creamy whites, pale pinks, despite the human species' wealth of built-in variation and despite our constant reference to race, no one has ever been able to suggest a truly reliable way to distinguish one race from another. While it is possible to classify a great many people of the... uh, uh, Many people on the basis of certain physical characteristics, there is no known features or group of features that will do the job in all cases. It has been suggested that skin color might be the criterion of race determination, and yet these provide innumerable difficulties because while most Africans from south of Sahara and their descendants around the world have skin that is darker than that of most Europeans, Europeans there are millions of people in India classified by many anthropologists as members of the Caucasoid race or the white race who have skin coloration that is darker than that of some Spaniards and Italians and Greeks and Lebanese. What about the Aborigines of of Africa? Or of Australia, rather. They're Caucasoid. But their skin is not the color of my skin. Now, see, the point I'm trying to make Races have been developed by men as a way of distinguishing between people. And what it has done has produced a concept of racism that has divided people right and left. Brother Thompson makes an interesting observation concerning the possible source of different colors of men. He says, thus uh, thus starting with two parents who were middle brown in color, Extreme racial colors, black and white, to name only two examples, could be produced in such a way that races would have permanently develop different colors. Of course, it also is possible to produce a middle brown race that would have a fixed middle brown color. Well, now, what are the major distinctions in the Scriptures? What are the major distinctions in the Word of God? It is not race, folks. It is languages and nations. Languages and nations. And that is validated without question in God's division of the nations in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. 
Now, what is the summation of some of the things that we have said in the course of this study together? Number one, we've said that God is the ultimate creator of all men. He is the father of the human race. Number two, all people came through Adam and Eve through Noah and their three sons. Number three, God originated the nations by confusing the languages of men at the Tower of Babel. And that resulted in the migration of men throughout the world. And the beginning, number five, that beginning has resulted in hundreds of nations and thousands of languages. And our own particular nation is a prime example with immigrants from all around the world with a melting pot of colors and languages and national origins. As Christians, we need to realize that God is not a God of color. God is not a God of one nation. God is not a God of one language. But God is the Father of us all. And more than that, He desires all men to be what? Saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. And to accomplish this, He sent His one and only begotten Son as a ransom for lost mankind. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I love the Great Commission, folks. I love the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Or go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even to the end of the world of the age. By the grace of God, we are transformed, all of us, no matter what our color might be, into an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that ye might show forth the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, who in times past were no people, but now are the people of God. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. Remember the words of Revelation 2 and verse 9, talking about Jesus, the Lamb of God. Thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by, the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue, and people, and nation. As the old song so truthfully declares, of one, of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall. Where sin has gone, must go His grace. The gospel is for all. I think if I could give anything, a bit of advice, the church of my Lord, something we ought to work on with all of our heart, with all of our soul, is to eliminate from our hearts, whether we are red or whether we are yellow or whether we are black or whether we are white or anywhere in between, any semblance of prejudice from our hearts because our God sent His Son to die for every single one of us. And brother, if you're here today, and you are, and I see many that are here, and your skin is darker than mine and maybe even lighter than mine because i got three tribes of Indian blood in me, then you're my brother, and we are part of God's family. And let's do everything within our power to try to reach the world that is lost in sin with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Maxie, thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you.